Good morning and welcome. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Jennifer Pelham and I'm the County Extension Director and Urban Horticulture Agent with the University of Florida IFIS Extension in Martin County. And welcome to Florida Friendly Landscaping, Let's Dig Deep. Today we're gonna to talk about principle number six, manage pests responsibly. As always, I'd like to give an overview of Florida Friendly Landscaping for those of you who are just joining us for the first webinar today. Florida Friendly Landscaping is an integrated approach to maintaining an attractive, colorful, and diverse yard. And the purpose is to educate Floridians about science-based, environmentally friendly landscape practices. We want to encourage Floridians to conserve and protect our water resources. And that starts in the backyard with how you treat your landscape. So these are the nine principles of the Florida Friendly Landscaping. You can see we're already on principle number six. So we, we started with right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch and attract wildlife was last week, and now we're on managing yard pests. Next week, we're gonna cover recycling yard waste, which has a lot with composting in your backyard. And then the final week, we're gonna talk about reducing stormwater runoff and protecting the waterfront. Hopefully every, everybody who attended our webinar in the past, the past few weeks have gotten the link to this publication, the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook. This publication provides you uh, with information on all the nine principles that we're covering over the seven weeks. And if you would like a copy of this, you can always stop by our office here in Martin County and pick up your free copy of the Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook. But you can get your free electronic copy on, on our Florida Friendly Landscaping website, which I will send you out that link after the class today. So let's talk about pest management and managing our pests in the landscape. First, I want to define what a pest is. A lot, a lot of people want think when they hear the word pest is they just think of insects, but pests go way beyond just insects. They include weeds, diseases of plants, of course insects, and also nematodes. Nematodes are unsegmented roundworms that live in our soil. They're almost invisible with the unaided eye, and um, but they do a lot of damage to your your plants, you can see from these photos here, the picture on the bottom left is nematode damage. The nematodes will feed on the roots of the plant and they cause the roots to become swollen, which limit the uptake of water and nutrients and then the plants end up dying. But we also should define what pest management is not. Pests, pests do not include nutrient deficiencies. We talked a lot about nutrient deficiencies when we talked about fertilizer. Pests do not include water imbalances, whether it be too much water or not enough water. Any mechanical injuries, such as injury from lightning strikes, uh, weed whackers, um, vehicles, um, any type of mechanical injury that you can think of, uh, lawnmower sitting plants. Uh, climatic effects such as hail, like you see this poor tomato plant in this fo photo that was hit with hail. Um, also heat, cold can be climatic effects that affect our plants and also just improper care. And a lot of the times when we have plant problems, we hate to admit it, but sometimes it's improper care or improper culture. Uh, so we don't plant the right plant in the right place or we don't water it appropriately or fertilize it uh, appropriately um, or prune it not to the, the standard, standards that it should be pruned. So there are a lot of improper care or cultural problems that, that we do to our plants that cause them problems. But we want to make sure that we manage pests responsibly and we are not striving for a pest-free landscape. We are in Florida after all and Florida is full of insects. There's a lot of different insects and diseases. We have lots of diseases in Florida for our plants. And we can't 
think that we can kill everything that's out there. And we don't want to kill everything that's out there um, with all our pests. We got to leave some food available for our beneficial insects, like our ladybugs, like you see in that photo there. If we killed all the aphids and other insects that the ladybugs ate, they wouldn't have any food left. So what we do is we practice integrated pest management. We like to call that IPM for short. And integrated pest management is using a lot of different tactics to manage our pests at a tolerable level. It is a sustainable approach that combines cultural, biological, physical, and chemical controls for acceptable pest management that minimizes environmental health, health and economic risks. So basically we're controlling our pests at a tolerable level and we're doing it in the safest way possible. And that's what IPM is or integrated pest management. But integrated pest management does start with good cultural practice. So if you think about our very first class that we had a few weeks ago, right plant, right place. We mentioned that that is the cornerstone of the Florida Friendly Landscape Program. And it definitely is. If we can find the right plant for the right place, the plant is healthier, the plant is happier, and it can ward off insects and diseases a lot easier. Uh, plus, when the plant is healthier, it's not prone to insects and diseases much. We wanna make sure that we replace problem-prone plants with pest-resistant species. I am not one to baby my plants. If there's a plant that continually gets insects over and over again, then that's not the plant for me. I would remove that and plant something that is, that is more pest resistant than the previous plant that was there. But you might have that favorite plant out there and it might get a lot of pests. And if you're willing to, to keep treating for the pests, that's perfectly, perfectly fine. Um, but part of the Florida Friendly Program is planting pest resistant uh, species. Sometimes we might just have to improve the plant environment, uh, which that goes back to the right plant, right place. Some plants that are sun loving plants, and if they're planted in the shade, they could be more, uh, they, they could get more insects or diseases uh, in the shady location than if they were, they were planted in the sun where they want to be. So that kind of goes with right plant, right place. You plant the plant in the wrong place. It's more pest prone than planted in the right place. Sometimes it might be a wet location. Maybe there's a, a location the plant's getting too much water, uh, maybe from a downspout uh, or runoff from the, the roof. And by improving the plant environment, by maybe redirecting that water from the downspout to keep a drier area for that plant, that could be improving the, the plant environment. We always wanna make sure that we water and fertilize appropriately. Too much water and too much fertilizer can actually induce pests. It can actually encourage pests such as aphids and other uh, sap sucking insects to come in because they love that new growth that's caused by too much fertilizer. And also diseases are the same way. There's a lot of plant diseases out there that will attack uh, plants that, that are growing quickly from too much fertilizer. And then of course, having too much water can induce a lot of uh, diseases such as fungi and bacteria. I also want to mention that diversity breeds stability. We want to make sure that we have a good representation in our landscape of a variety of different plants. I believe I mentioned in a previous presentation about a resort in Central Florida that had palm trees. They had 700 queen palms and a disease came in and attacked their palm trees and without having that diversity of plants in their landscape, that disease took out all 700 of the queen palms. So if they mixed and matched and had different palms or had different plants in the place, they, their landscape wouldn't have been as devastated as it was. So you wanna make sure that you diversify your landscape. So in case there is a disease that comes and attacks a certain plant, you're not losing your entire landscape or a significant portion of your landscape. And that also goes with with climatic effects. You wanna make sure that you have a good representation of cold tolerant and, and tropical plants. So if we did have a, a cold weather that damaged a lot of our plants, we wouldn't lose our entire tropical landscape if we had some cold tolerant plants mixed in. 
So with the landscape integrated pest management, we have some concepts that we want to discuss. We want to discuss monitoring and scouting for pests, talk about some of the key pests and key plants, what are action thresholds, and then of course interventions or control. How do we control these pests that come into our landscape? The first is monitoring and scouting. We want to make sure that we go out to our landscape and look at it on a regular basis. And this does not have to be every day, but maybe once a week or once a month, you go out and you look at your plants and see what's going on with the plants. Do they look healthy? Do they look like they are struggling? Do you see any insects or uh, in symptoms on the plants? Do you see any problems that the plants might be experiencing? And you wanna do this on a regular basis. We get a lot of people that come into our help desk, the plant clinic here, and they, and they say, oh, it happened overnight. Well, it probably didn't happen overnight. It might be that you just didn't check on your plants as often as you should, um, because insects and diseases are not gonna kill your plants overnight. Uh, cold weather, yes, cold weather can definitely kill your, your plants overnight, but not insects or diseases. It takes time to do so. So we wanna monitor and scout on a regular basis so we can catch these problems early, so we can control them early before they cause irreversible damage to our plants. Key plants are plants that have a high incidence of pest problems due to inherent sus 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 yeah, susceptibility or mismanagement. Uh, you see a rose here. Now there are some roses that do very well here in Florida, especially our heritage or old garden roses but you plant some of the hybrid tea roses and you're gonna be struggling with, with di plant diseases on those roses, particularly a uh, black spot because they're just more susceptible to that, to that disease. Roses are also more susceptible to a insect called chili thrips. So the, the idea of key plants is that if you plant a plant that you know is susceptible to certain pests, you're gonna have to monitor that plant on a more than normal than you would other plants, so you can catch those pests on a uh, catch those pests problems um, uh, faster than you would maybe some non-pest prone plants. And then we have our key pests. So key pests is an organism that is frequently encountered in landscapes, and predictably causes injury to key plants. So here we have damage of a rose that's called by chili thrips. Chili thrips are these small elongated insects that suck the juices out of the leaves and out of the flower buds. And you can see the damage that they cause on these photos here. So knowing that if you plant roses in your garden that you might get, most likely get chili thrips. So you're gonna to have to keep an eye out for them and monitor them for them. Another key, key plant and key pest would be hibiscus. If you plant hibiscus out in your landscape, you're probably gonna have aphid insects or mealybug insects on those plants because hibiscus are highly prone to aphids and mealybugs. And I'm not saying don't plant them, you just need to be aware that these are popular pest problems that they get. And here are a few more. T-scale on camellias, the Asian cycad scale on the sago palms, and of course, the oleander caterpillar and oleander. If you plant oleander, uh, these, these little oleander caterpillars will come in and they can devour your oleander plant within a few days. So that, that particular uh, problem can happen overnight. You go out one day and you have no leaves left on your oleander. The, a key to that, if you see these beautiful blue moths flying around your oleander, Guarantee that's the oleander moth laying her eggs on your oleander, which soon will hatch into oleander caterpillars. When we talk about integrated pest management and we monitor for these pests, whether it be a key plant or key pest or just monitoring our landscape in general, when we do find a pest, we wanna make sure that we ID it properly. Correct ID of the pest is crucial for proper control because there's a lot of pest problems out there and sometimes it's hard to tell if it's an insect causing the problem on your plant or if it's a disease causing the problem on your plant. So it takes a little bit of detective work. One, the first step is identifying your plant because like we said, there's a lot of key pests that are associated with certain plants. 
Uh, and if you don't know what's causing problem to your plants, you can always bring it into our help desk here and we can diagnose it for you. But it's important to know because if you have an insect, then you're going to want to use an insecticide possibly to on that plant. Or if it's a if it's a disease like a fungus, you're going to want to use a fungicide to control that disease on the plant. Fungicides won't kill insects and insecticides won't kill fungi. So you want to make sure that you yet you ID the problem properly so you can treat it properly. So let's talk about some common pests in the garden and landscape. And I'm going to start with insects. The first is aphids. And a friend of mine just texted me a picture of her hibiscus with all these aphids on and asked me, what is going on with my hibiscus? So hibiscus, or I mean, sorry, aphids are definitely very popular in the Florida landscape. And these ones here uh, happen to be on the hibiscus plant, um, but know that, that aphids come in all different colors. These ones here are kind of a pale yellow or green color, but they can be bright yellow, red, brown, black, uh, yellow with black legs. Uh, they can even be blue. There's blue aphids that are found on the podocarpus. So to identify aphids, they have kind of have a pear shaped to them and they have these two big eyes and on their backside, and it might be really hard to see with, with this particular uh, photo here, but on the backside, they have these little uh, stems that stick out of their, of their backside. They're, they're called cornicles. And that's how you tell that that's an aphid. And they're quite small. And you'll usually find these insects on the backside of the leaf because they're trying to hide from their predators. And they take their stylet or their mouth part and they stick it into the leaf and they just suck the juices out of the leaf. And they cause the leaves to become very deformed. As they suck the juices out, the leaf will shrink and wrinkle. And they also excrete a sticky substance called honeydew. The honeydew is the aphid poop basically. And on that honeydew grows a, a sooty mold. If you look at that bottom picture there, you see some black uh, sooty mold that's growing on that, that hibiscus leaf. And that is an indication or sign that you have, that you have a piercing sucking insect such as an uh, aphid on your plant. Um, so the, the sooty mold doesn't cause any harm to your plant, but it's an indication that you have insects that do cause harm, harm to your plant. The next insect I want to talk about is mealybugs. Mealybugs are come in different different sizes and shapes. Also, they may, they mostly look like like a, a round, or I should say an oval with these white uh, filaments that are sticking out of them, and then they have the these white this other white residue that's associated with them. You can see here they're on this plant here, um, covering the stem. And if you look closely, you also see that black sooty mold. Mealybugs also excrete a honeydew substance, which grows that sooty mold. Again, the sooty mold is not harmful to the plant, but it's an indication that you have a piercing uh, plant uh, sucking insects such as the, the mealybug or an aphid. And these guys do crawl around. And the little yellow ones you see in the photo are the immature mealybugs. Then there's the scale insects. Scale insects are interesting because they are stationary for the majority of their life. They crawl for a little bit when they're young, but once they're an adult, they just stay in one spot the whole time. And they have this mouth part that's like a straw and they stick it into the, into the leaf of the plant or the stem of the plant and they just suck the juices out there for the rest of their life. You can see from that drawing there, it's like kind of like a turtle in her shell and then she, puts in her little stylet, her mouth part into the plant. And then also she can lay eggs uh, under there, under her, her covering. And scale insects come, come in all different sizes and colors and shapes also. And there are soft scales and there are armored or hard scales. The soft scales are going to excrete honeydew and you'll have sooty mold associated with the, with the soft scales, just like you would with the aphids in the mealybugs. The hard scales or the armored scales do not excrete that honeydew, do not, do not produce that sooty mold. 
Um, but here's some, some ones at some scale that you'll see in Florida. And there's literally dozens to hundreds of more scale species out there. But you have the, the Florida wax scale. You have the immatures, which are those small white ones with the fringe. And then the adults are the ones that are, uh, that are larger that kind of look like alien spaceships to me. And then you have the armored scales, the red, Florida red scale, there's T scale that you can find on the camellias. So there's a lot of different scale insects out there that are found. And often they look like they're just a part of the plant because again, they don't move for most of their life. The next insect we have is thrips. Uh, thrips, whether it's plural or singular, it's always with an S. So you have one thrips or many thrips. Uh, thrips are small elongated insects. And we saw a picture of the thrips on the rose, but they also can be on a lot of other different plants. And there's different thrips out there. This one here is a yellow uh, colored thrips and they can also be black. And they will suck the juices out of the leaves also, and they leave this dis discoloration to the leaf as they suck the juices out. And they're hard to find also. Sometimes they're hidden in the leaf buds or in the, in the flower buds. So a great way to, to see if you have thrips is to take a white sheet of paper and shake your plant out on that white sheet of paper. And if you have thrips, they should fall out onto that paper and that's how you can find them. But they are quite small. They're hard to see on the plant. The next insect that I want to talk about is white flies. White flies are very common here in Florida. There's a lot of different types of white flies also. You have the nymphs, which are the ones that are going to feed on the plant and cause the damage, but then you have the non-feeding adult. And what she is doing is she's going around laying more eggs on your plants. Um, the white flies are not flies. They aren't related to house flies or horse flies. They're called white flies just because they're white and they fly. If you have a plant that has white flies, if you bump that plant and there's any adults on the underside of the leaf, they typically fly, you disturb them and they fly around the plant. Um, but the immatures, like you see here, those ovals are, they do not fly. So they will always be on, on the plant. But again, they, they suck the juices out of the leaves, just like the aphids and the white and the scale and the mealybugs. And the white flies do have, do excrete honeydew and they do have sooty mold associated with them. So you will see sooty mold with the white flies. And a lot of times with the sooty mold, that black substance, you'll see it on the, on the plant, but you also see it on non-living things. It will get on your sidewalk, it will get on your car, it will get on your patio furniture. Wherever the, the plant is and whatever's below where the plant, where the insect is excreting their droppings, where that honeydew falls, will grow that sooty mold. It doesn't have to grow just on the plant. And again, the sooty mold is non-pathogenic. It doesn't cause any harm to your plants. There's also lots of caterpillars out there. And most of the caterpillars that we have here in Florida are harmless to people, but they can devastate your plants. Uh, so we have the tomato hornworm. He looks scary with that horn on his backside, uh, but it's going to devour your plants and not just tomato plants either. I've seen tomato hornworms on landscape plants as well as vegetable plants. There's the palm leaf skeletonizer, which is a caterpillar that feeds on palm fronds. And you usually don't see it until the palm frond opens up and you notice all this frass, frass is caterpillar poop. You see all this frass inside and you see where the caterpillar has eaten away the green tissue of the palm frond. That's pretty, uh, there's nothing that we really need to do with, with that caterpillar, with the uh, palm leaf caterpillar uh, skeletonizer. It's pretty harmless. Then we have the oleander caterpillar. It looks pretty dangerous, but those hairs on that cater caterpillar do not sting you. You don't have to worry about them. The fall webworm uh, usually is a, is a cyclical type of insect. It will come and go every few years. Uh, some years we'll have really bad infestations of the fall webworm out in our forested areas. And then some years we won't. The snowbush uh, spanworm, it's a cute little 
inchworm, but it will devour your snow in the mountain or snow bushes. I, this, I remember when I was working up in central Florida in our demonstration garden, we had snow bush and we had these beautiful black and white butterflies flying around. Uh, and I was commenting how pretty they were. And then a few days later, we noticed there was no leaves left on the snow bush. So these beautiful black and white butterflies were flying around laying their eggs on the snow bush, which hatched out the snow bush span worm and that span worm devoured our snow bushes. So we, we treated for the caterpillars and um, they still came back and treated for them again and finally just took out the snow bush because it was a pest prone and got tired of treating for that, for that insects and planted something else. So if you have a snow bush, you may or may not have the snow bush caterpillar or span worm. And then there's a bagworm. Bagworms are pretty neat. Uh, they build their little cocoons out of sticks and leaves from the plant that they're feeding on. And they're typically not a huge problem. I've, I have seen them devour some plants, but typically you only have a few on one plant at a time. Um, but if you have a problem with them, they're easy just to pick off. And with all these caterpillars, you can just pick them off and dispose of them. Um, that's easy way, but we'll talk about control in a, in a little bit. And then there's grasshoppers. Grasshoppers are generalists, which means they, they can eat just about anything. So the, the most devastating grasshopper in Florida is the lubber grasshopper. This is a, as an adult, it's a huge grasshopper. It's probably um, about four to five inches in length. And its favorite food is the crinum lily, but it will eat just about, about anything. And they're really hard to control when they're adults because they jump and fly. So when you, to control the grasshoppers, you would control them when they're young, when they're small and uh, easier to catch. And then finally, we have spider mites. Spider mites are not an insect. They're actually an arachnid. They're related to spiders. They have eight legs, not six legs like insects do but they can cause a lot of damage on your plants. And you'll see here, they create these webs to go from leaf to leaf. And they do suck the juices out of the leaves like some of the other insects that we talked about. So they will cause that discoloration. Um, but you, you won't be able to control these with an, an insecticide. You have to get something that's also labeled for mates, mites, mites to control these. There's a question about the oleander caterpillar causing a rash if you pick it off. Um, the oleander itself has a sap in it that can be poisonous. So when the caterpillar consumes the leaves, they are consuming that sap. So you could have an allergic reaction to the, the caterpillar. That's a possibility. Yeah, be careful with the oleander plant. It is a, it is a poisonous plant. And so the caterpillars, when they eat it, they're actually poisonous to the birds. So the birds won't eat those, those caterpillars. Next, let's talk about some common diseases that you might find out into, in the landscape. For a disease to be present, you have to have a host that's susceptible to the disease. You have to have the right environment for the disease. Most diseases like like to have humid, hot conditions. There are a few diseases that, that like it cold, but most of it like, like it humid and wet and hot. And then you also have to have the pathogen or the disease present. So if you have all three present, then the disease can live. One of the most popular is leaf spots. Leaf spots can happen on all of our plants. Uh, the leaf spots we have here are the Entomosporium leaf spot, which is the purple one. That's common on the Indian hawthorn plant. And then the, the one on the right is the Cicospora leaf spot. That that's very common on your ligustrums. But leaf spots can happen on all different plants and many, many different types of fungi can cause the leaf spots. And it's the leaf, most of the fungal leaf spots like water, overhead the irrigation, they like humid conditions and they spread through, usually through water, but they can also spread on your pruning tools or even on your hands if you touch a plant that has the fungal disease and then touch, a, touch another plant. Then there's powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is common in our vegetable garden as well as our landscape. Uh, here you can see that the powdery mildew is on a cucumber plant. 
And it is also on the crepe myrtle. And the powdery mildew is prevalent right now. We, I have seen it in some vegetable gardens and on the crepe myrtles, they like cooler temperature, it likes cooler temperatures, but also wet conditions. Rust. Rust is a, is a neat type of fungi because it produces these bright gold, yellow gold uh, masses on the back of the leaf. And you can actually feel this fungus. Uh, you can actually touch it and it gets, it's kind of silky feeling. Um, so the fungus is on the back side of the leaf on this particular example with the plumeria. And then on the front side, you can see where the fungus has eaten away at the leaf, causing the leaf to turn yellow, to have those yellow spots on it. So when you see a problem on your plant on the top, always turn it over and see what's happening on the back of the leaf. So if I looked at this, it, oh, it could be fungal looking at the top, or it could be an insect causing that damage. Maybe there's scale insects underneath. And when you turn it over, you can see, oh, I see that this is, happens to be a rust fungal disease and it's not scale. So you wanna make sure, again, identification is the key, but looking underneath the leaf can help you identify it. Then there's bacterial blights that can occur. This happens a lot in the vegetable garden, not so much in the landscape, uh, but can be a problem. And then root rots. Root rots happen a lot with over irrigation or wet locations where the water just sits in the soil and never seems to drain and doesn't allow the roots of the plant to get any air. Uh, you can see this in lawns with take all root rot that can happen on St. Augustine. It can also happen in your, with your landscape plants that are, that are overly wet. And then we have a lot of different palm diseases that are in our landscape. And I just wanted to mention those later this summer, I will do a presentation on palms and palm diseases because it's becoming prevalent in our area with these diseases out there. And there are a lot of palm trees that are dying from these diseases and they're lethal diseases, which is very unfortunate to our palms. The one on the top left is Ganoderma and that uh, attacks all different types of palm trees. You'll see these mushroom-like uh, growths coming out the, of the trunk, uh, which indicates fungal growth from a decaying trunk. Um, you can have lethal yellowing from the bottom picture on the left. There's uh, lethal bronzing, which is the bottom photo on the right of the Canary Island date palm or the Sylvester date palm. And then there's also fusarium wilt which is occurring on our cabbage palms and uh, queen palms and Washingtonia or the Mexican fan palms, which is the photo on the top right. So these are all devastating diseases out there. And I just wanted you to be aware that they're out there and they're causing a lot of harm to the palm trees in Florida. So another pest that we have in our landscape is weeds. Weeds, whether they're in your turf grass or in your landscape can be a problem because weeds can uh, steal water and nutrients from our plant. They can outgrow your desirable plant that's there like your turf grass and they can also they just be a problem overall. So there's different types of landscape weeds. There's broadleaf weeds. Broadleaf weeds are weeds that have usually have a uh, round type of leaf and they have netted veins, which means the veins of the leaf go in different directions. And they typically have showy flowers to them. Then there's grass weeds. Grass weeds have parallel veins. If you look at the leaf, the leaf, all the veins go in one direction. They don't have particularly showy flowers, like you see the photo in the middle. And if we cut open the stem of a, of a grass weed, it would be hollow. And then there are sedges. Sedges, their stem is triangular. It has three sides to it. So we like to say sedges have edges. So if you feel the sedge, which is the photo on the far right, it would have three sides to that stem where the grass weed would, have, would be round and have no edges and it would be hollow. So that's how you can tell the difference between a sedge and a grass. And the, why is it important to tell the difference between a broadleaf weed, a grass weed, and a sedge? If these weeds were growing in your turf grass, in your St. Augustine grass or your Bahia grass, 
it's important to identify broadleaf grass or sedge if you are going to use a chemical control because there's chemicals that will control one but not the other. Uh, for example, you can put a, a, a selective herbicide down on your turf grass that will kill the broadleaf weeds but not kill the grasses, grass weeds or your St. Augustine grass because your St. Augustine grass and grass weeds are related. They're they're uh, monocots, they're related, but they're not related to the broadleaf weeds, so it will kill the broadleaf weeds in your lawn. So it's important to identify your weeds. Sunny's asking, oh, back to the palms. Is the Ganoderma always look like that? Yes, the Ganoderma, let me go back real quick. The Ganoderma, it's gonna start off like a round, uh, kind of round and flat um, mushroom-like on the side of your uh, palm tree, and then it's going to grow into that shelf fungus. But yes, Ganoderma always looks like that. It might be, have different colors, but it's going to be a shelf fungus like that. So once we identify the pests, we need to have an action threshold. When do we take control of the situation? Remember, we're not striving for pest free. We can share some of our plants with some of the pests out there. Um, and not all pest infestations are true infestations that are going to cause irreversible damage to your plant. So if you look at these two examples here, we have a leaf spot, Entomosporium leaf spot on the Indian hawthorn. That, that leaf spot is getting pretty, pretty bad. You can see there's spots on almost every leaf there. Soon it's going to cause the plant to lose its leaves because the, the leaves are going to be overtaken by this, by this fungal disease. So that would probably be a time that we're going to want to take control. And if you look at this other poor plant over here that's covered in sooty mold, there's an insect and I can't see from the photo, it could be aphids, it could be mealybugs, it could be scale insects, it could be white fly that are feeding on this plant and causing all this sooty mold to build up on the plant, uh, that piercing sucking insect that's releasing that honeydew. So that's definitely a sign, if I look at that photo, to take control of that situation because that plant is no longer aesthetic enough to be in the landscape. It's looking kind of rough, I would say. So once we meet that threshold that we want to control our pests, and everybody has different thresholds, uh, we want to manage them. So how do we manage them? We can physically manage them by removing them. We can culturally manage them by, by maybe fertilizing less, fertilizing more, water control, planting the right plant in the right place. We could rely on biological controls such as our ladybugs, or we could chemically treat them. In, with integrated pest management, chemi chemical control is always the last option. We want to try to physically, culturally, or biologically control the pests first. So how do we physically control them? Physically controlling them, if they were caterpillars, we would just pick them off the plant. Maybe have a bucket of soapy water that you could throw them into. Some people don't mind just cutting them with their pruners, cutting them in half. Um, in not just caterpillars, other insects, you could do this too. If you have a plant that has aphids on it, maybe the aphids are only on one leaf or one stem, you could prune that, just that one leaf or one stem off that plant and control that aphid population. And I really like the photo on the bottom, how to control um, the grubs and the turf grass using those, those shoes with the spikes on it. That's a way that you can physically or mechanically control the grubs in turf grass. So um, with weeds, if it was weeds, we would physically remove, you can physically remove them by hand. Cultural control, again, right plant, right place is the best cultural control there is you know, the plant's happier, it's healthier, it's gonna ward off the insects and diseases better. Uh, sometimes it could be water. Diseases like water. So the photo on the right is showing water is sp splashing onto the leaf of the plant. If we reduce overhead irrigation or try to reduce the leaves from getting wet, that can help control the diseases of the plants. So by just watering the soil, and not getting the leaves wet can control fungal diseases and bacterial diseases of the, of the leaves of the plant. The photo of the turf grass on the left, that's called large patch. Large patch is a 
disease, a fungal disease of turf grass, but it's induced with over fertilization and over watering. So controlling the fertilizer and controlling over irrigation can control large patch disease in your turf grass. So we wanna make sure that we water appropriately and we fertilize appropriately uh, in our landscape also so we don't induce the pest. Another way for cultural control is planting plants that are not pest prone, um, either whether it be disease or insect, or insect pest prone. For diseases, there are a lot of plants out there that are immune to diseases, which means they won't get it. There's also plants that are resistant to them, which means that they, there's some cultivars of the, of the plant species that are less likely to get the disease than others. And then there's are also some plants that are tolerant of the disease, which means they'll get the disease, but it doesn't bother them, they'll still grow. So for example, with crepe myrtles, we talked about crepe myrtles getting the powdery mildew. There are, there are cultivars of crepe myrtles that do not get the powdery mildew. There are cultivars of the squash plants and the cucumber plants that don't get powdery mildew. So choosing the right cultivar can help with disease management. And uh, plants that are tolerant diseases, I showed you the picture of the ligustrum with the Sacospora leaf spot. The ligustrum will grow just fine with that leaf spot. We don't have to control that leaf spot uh, unless we just don't like the way it looks, but the plant will not um, be hurt by having that disease. So just an example with some of your, uh, with some of the, the seed packets that you might purchase, whether it be for flowers or, or for vegetable plants. If you read the, the seed packets, some of them will say if a plant is resistant or not of certain diseases. For example, these snapdragons are, are resistant to rust, which is a fungal disease. The better boy tomatoes are resistant to VFN. Well, VFN, what does that mean? Well, V is Versilium, which is a fungal disease. F is Fusarium, which is a fungal disease. And N is nematodes. Nematodes, if you remember, are those unsegmented roundworms that live in our soils. And then the zinnias we have are resistant to powder, uh, are resistant to mildew. So some of the cultivars are resistant to diseases that might commonly attack certain cultivars of plants. We also want to culturally control diseases with our pruning tools. A lot of times, unfortunately, we spread the diseases from plant to plant from our pruning tools. This happens a lot on hedges that are sheared. So if part of the hedge has the disease and we're shearing it, we can spread that disease throughout the entire hedge. The disease fungal spores will stick on our tools and they'll just be deposited throughout the entire shrub. We also can transfer palm diseases on our pruning tools. So it's really important to clean our pruning tools between uh, plants. So how do we clean our pruning tools? We can use a 10% bleach solution. We can use a pine oil solution, uh, rubbing alcohol, or even just a disinfectant spray can, can uh, kill the fungal spores and diseases on our pruning tools. So it's really good practice to have when you're pruning between your plants so you aren't spreading that the disease from plant to plant. Now there's also biological control. We hopefully can re rely on biological control. With biological control, we have predators. These are gonna be the larger, faster uh, insects that are gonna feed on other insects like ladybugs and lacewings, spiders, flies and ground beetles and wasps. Then we have parasitoids, which actually lay their eggs inside of the bad insects. And we'll show some examples of that. And there's also good or beneficial pathogens or um, good fungi. So there are good nematodes, there are good bacterias, there are good fungi that can attack uh, insects. So this is a ladybug, probably not the typical ladybug that you're used to seeing. So ladybugs can come in all different colors and sizes. Uh, this is the Ola vinigrum ladybug, and it's black with little red spots on it, and it's smaller than your typical ladybug. But if you look at that funny looking organism over on the right, 
That looks like a little mini alligator, but that little alligator is actually the larva or the young stage of the ladybug. So that alligator looking guy will turn into that the ladybug that you see here. So if you see these guys on your plant, those are the good guys that are feeding on the aphids and the mealybugs and the scale insects. Then we also have the green lace wings. The green lace wings, you can see their, what their eggs look like. They look like their little pins uh, on the leaf. They also like to eat aphids and insect eggs, scale insects, mealybugs, and spider mites. And the adult is really pretty with the lace, with the lace wings that you see there. There's also a brown lace wing, um, which I don't, which I don't have a photo of the adult, but if you look at that bug up on the top right, that's actually an insect. That's called a trash bug. And what he or she does is they put this debris, this plant debris on their back to disguise themselves from predators. But that's just a larva of a brown lace wing. Like the guy below, you see that's the larva of the green lace wing. And she's picked up an aphid. I don't know if you can see it, the aphid's green, picked it up with her mouth parts and is just sucking the juice out of that aphid and eating it. Pretty cool. Then we have parasitic wasps. These guys are beneficial too. They're really small. They're not like a paper wasp that stings us. They don't sting humans, but they do sting insects. And when they sting the insects, they deposit or lay eggs in, inside the insect. So here you can see the wasp. They're about the size of a gnat. She's laying her egg inside the caterpillar. And then if you see that caterpillar up on the right, top right, those are the cocoons of the wasp that have come out of that caterpillar and they're slowly killing that. So if you see a caterpillar with this funny looking thing sticking on the backside, that's actually a good thing. They're gonna, they're gonna kill, let that caterpillar alone because those are gonna hatch out and more flies are gonna come about. And then the bottom photo there, those are aphids, believe it or not. We call them mummy aphids. And let me show you a better picture of that. So here we have a parasitic wasp and she has laid her eggs in the aphid insect. And when the egg hatches inside the aphid, the larva of that fly or that wasp will consume the inside of the aphid, causing it to die and kind of and become swollen, like you see there. Eventually, that larva is going to turn into an adult fly uh, wasp, parasitic wasp, and she's going to emerge out the backside of that aphid, like you see that you see that circle or that hole coming out of that backside of the aphid. That's a dead aphid or a mummy aphid that was parasitized by the wasp. So you might, if you have aphids, if you look closely, you might see these brown aphids that are kind of swollen, mixed in. Those aphids were actually parasitized by the, the parasitic wasp. So it's pretty neat. And then spiders. I know a lot of people are scared of spiders, but the majority of spiders, especially ones that are in our landscape, are good guys. And they're out there feeding on the insects for you. Uh, there's a green lynx spiders, the, the crab spiders, the wolf spiders are all doing a good job controlling insects in our garden. Uh, we really need to only be concerned about the, the black widow and the brown widow spiders here in Florida. And they're usually ones are, that are very scared of you. They're going to run from you. When people get bit by a, a black or brown widow, it's usually on uh, wood piles or underneath picnic tables or patio furniture where you might go to move a piece of furniture and you put your hand on that spider and she will bite you um, because of that. But usually they don't come, they don't actually run towards you to, to bite you. But most of the spiders are good guys. And then with weed control, weed control, cultural, um, keeping your, your lawn healthy, watering appropriately, fertilizing appropriately. If you have a healthy lawn, the lawn can outcompete the weeds. But if you start to have weeds in your landscape, uh, remember we can use mulch. We talked about that, la that last week, using three inches of mulch is a physical way to keep mulch out of the landscape. And you can also pull them out by hand. That would be a mechanical or physical way to get rid of weeds. And I mentioned earlier, there are chemical ways you can get rid of weeds. Uh, just be careful with the chemicals and choosing the right product because a lot of the, the chemicals out there, the weed killers uh, in the landscape, whether they're organic or non-organic, they can kill anything green that they touch. <laughs> so you wanna make sure you don't spray it on your desirable plants and only 
sprayed on the weeds themselves. Um, also, if you're putting weed control in your lawn, um, know uh, the non-selective weed control kills anything green, so you wouldn't put that in your lawn, but the selective will, keep, will kill the broadleaf weeds in your lawns. So let's talk a little bit about chemical control. And as always, pesticides should be your last resort. Be aware of non-target organisms. So we don't want to kill the good, we don't want to kill our ladybugs and our green lace wings out there, or we don't want to kill our desirable plants. And always try the least toxic or bioirrational pesticide first. And we want to spot treat our pesticides. We don't just spray our entire landscape. It's very, very uncommon that you're going to have an insect that's going to come in and devour your entire landscape. The majority of insects and diseases are host specific. They only attack their key plants, key pests for the key plants. And we wanna make sure that we only use pesticides minimally so we don't, so our insects don't gain a tolerant to the insecticide that we use. We may, gotta make sure that we don't spray too much that we're killing our ladybugs and our other beneficials. So they are insects too. So if we use an insecticide on our plants that the insecticide doesn't know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug. So if we kill, we also don't wanna kill every single insect out there because if we kill all the aphids and all the mealybugs then there won't be any food left for our, our, our good guys to eat and they could starve. So these are some bioirrational pesticides. There's a lot out there um, and I'm not endorsing one brand over another. These are just here for examples. Um, for fungicides, copper, copper fungicide and neem oil are considered organic um, to use. Uh, insecticidal soaps and horticultural oils are, are insecticides that you can use. And um, neem oil is actually an insecticide and a fungicide. So you get two for one. Make sure that you always read the label on these because especially the oils cannot be applied when temperatures are over 85 degrees. And if you live here in Martin County, today's gonna be one of those days that it's gonna be over 85 de degrees. So you don't wanna use the neem oil. The surface of the leaf gets too hot. And when you put that oil on the leaf, it can burn the leaf. And then BT or Bacillus thuringiensis, this is a great product for caterpillars. It doesn't kill any other organism on the face of the earth, but caterpillars. So this was great and safe to use in your vegetable garden as well as your landscape. Just make sure you don't use it on your butterfly garden because it kills caterpillars and it does not know the difference between the bad caterpillars and the good caterpillars. And then we have synthetic pesticides. Synthetic pesticides are man-made pesticides. There's bifenthrin, malathion, and imidacloprid. Those are all types of insecticides. And then the dacanil or the chlorophenol is a uh, synthetic fungicide that's labeled for use uh, in your landscape. As far as fungicides go, fungicides are not curative. So where insecticides, you have to have the insects present to kill the insects. Fungicides will kill the fungi, but they also can be used as a protectant on your plant. So if you know every year that your plant gets a particular fungus, as the new growth starts to emerge, you can spray that with a fungicide and use it as a protectant uh, against fungus. So that's, that's a possibility um, to use that. But in, as far as insecticides go against insects, most of the insecticides out there for the homeowner do not have much of a residual, which means that you can't just spray your plants and expect the insects to stay away. You have to, they're contact killers. They only, they only kill the insects when they have direct contact with the insect. So that's important to know. And here at the University of Florida, we do not recommend home remedies. And the reason why we don't recommend home remedies is because your home remedies, these, these items here that you see that you have available in your, in your kitchen cabinets or underneath the sink are not labeled as pesticides. So they should not be used as pesticides because they don't have any directions on them to use them as a pesticide and there's no safety information on them when you're using them as a pesticide. So we can't endorse using in using any homemade remedies as a pesticide. Um, and I've seen people do their homemade remedies and actually kill their plant because they put too much of one product uh, in, in the concoction that they made up. So it's important to only use 
pesticides with a label so you so you can read the label and know how to use it properly so you don't hurt your plants and you don't uh, hurt yourself. So we always read the label of our pesticides. The label is the law. It tells you where and what it can be used on. For example, you would not want to use a pesticide that's labeled for your landscape in your vegetable garden. Only use pesticides labeled for vegetable gardens in your vegetable garden. I. Uh, you want to make sure that you read the hazards that might be for humans, pets, or an environment. The label tells you your personal protective equipment. After this past year, we all know what PPE stands for now, personal protective equipment. Those in the pesticide industry has all, have always known what that, that means, but that's how you, how you protect yourself from the, the chemical. So whether it will tell you if you have to wear gloves, long pants, long sleeves, goggles, or closed-toed shoes, it will tell you how to properly mix and apply the pesticide, tells you the first aid information if you happen to become exposed to the pesticide. And if you're using it on an edible plant, it tells you how many days you have to wait before you can harvest and eat that, that particular plant. And it will tell you how to store the, and dispose of the pesticide. So these are all the, inf the information that the label tells you that in your home remedy concoctions, you don't have this information. So you do, that's why we can't, endorse the use of home remedies. We also want to make sure that we minimize our insect resistance when we use insecticides. Um, if we use the same pesticide over and over again on a particular insect or weed or disease, that insect disease or weed can build up a resistance to that pesticide. So it's important to rotate your pesticides. If you always get one brand, maybe the next time you go to the garden center, buy a different type of pesticide so your, in, so your insects and weeds don't build up that resistance against that pesticide. So to manage pests responsibly, we want to make sure that we use good cultural practices. We want to make sure that we ID our key pests and key plants. If you know what plants in your landscape are prone to pests, you can keep a better eye out on them. Monitor and scout frequently so you can catch pest problems early. Establish your pest tolerant threshold. How many pests does it take that it's gonna cause irreversible damage to your plants? Sometimes that's a personal decision. You might not want one brown leaf on your plant and that's fine. And then we wanna intervene when necessary by using physical controls, biological controls um, or chemical controls. And also cultural, Some I forgot to put that in there. Cultural controls are are important too, to keep your plants healthy and happy. And let people know about integrated pest management, IPM. Most organisms in your yard are not pests. Actually, less than 1% of all insects in the world cause us harm. So most of the 99% of them are just coexist with us. They don't cause harm to our plants, to our pets, to our, to our structures or to ourselves. Uh, so that's why we don't wanna kill everything out there. A lot of the organisms out there are beneficials. They could be pollinators. Uh, they could be good insects that are eating the bad insects. Bad cultural practices induce our plant pests. So keep your plants healthy. And again, pest present, pest present doesn't mean that there's a pest problem. A few insects here and there is not going to cause irreversible damage, but keep an eye on populations in case they get worse. And always strive for a balance of the good guys and the bad guys out there. If you're hiring somebody to do best control for you, ask them about their integrated pest management plan. You don't want a, a, a company that just comes out and sprays just because it's the time of the month to spray for insects. So are you willing to pay for the expertise versus just routine pesticide applications where people are gonna only use pesticides when there is a pest problem? So they actually come out and they do the inspection by looking for pests. If you're hiring pest, pesticide applicators, make sure they are licensed. All pesticide applicators must be licensed by the state of Florida. So with that, I'll take any questions uh, that you might have and as you're writing down any questions, I wanted to let you know about a presentation that we have coming up next Wednesday. So of course, next Wednesday, Wednesday we do have Florida Friendly Landscaping Let's Dig Deep at 11 a.m., but we also have a Color in the Native Plant Landscape at 6 p.m. that evening. It's gonna be presented by Master Gardener Ellen Broderick, and she's gonna talk about how you can use native plants and still have color 
from the native plants in your landscape. And it's a free webinar to attend. It's also gonna be presented via the Zoom. Uh, so take a quick picture of this slide here or write it down so you can go ahead and register for this webinar uh, that's happening next Wednesday. And I'll also mention it next Wednesday too to, as a reminder. And as always, I'm gonna send you out a list of references that will be emailed this afternoon on um, managing pests responsibly. And uh, if you have any questions, or if you find any issues or pests that you need identified, you can always drop them off at the Master Gardener help desk or give us a call or send us pictures. And I am starting a new, new newsletter. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter. I will put that in my email I send you this afternoon. So you just click on the link and sign up for the newsletter. It's also our mailing list that we send out with announcements. Uh, so you might be on our, our old mailing list, which has migrated to our new mailing list. So if you're on the old mailing list, you already are signed up for this newsletter, I should say. And then next week, we're going to talk about recycling yard waste. So basically composting. Oh, okay. Liz wants me to go back to the webinar information. So I will go back to that. So does anybody have any other questions? I'll send you guys, when I send you an email this afternoon, I'll also send you the, this publication or this, this flyer so you can uh, sign up for this webinar too. I'll, I'll make sure to include that. So how to sign up for our, our newsletter or email list and also the reference sheet. So with that, I don't see any more questions. So thank you guys for attending, um, managing your pests properly. And next week we're gonna talk about talk about composting or recycling yard waste. So I hope you guys have a great rest of the day and we went for the full hour today. So have a, have a great lunch and we'll talk to you later.